Hey, how's it going guys? Today we will be taking an exclusive look at the campaign for Total War Three Kingdoms as Lupe. I managed to get hands on with the first 30 turns of the campaign and in this video I'll give you my honest opinion as a veteran of the series on the mechanics I ran into. Do keep in mind that I did only get 3 hours with the campaign so features I may praise might end up being shallow as I get more time with the game and vice versa. If you enjoyed this video please consider dropping a like on the video as it really helps out the channel immensely and be sure to comment down below what you thought of the gameplay. Let's start off by watching Lu Bei's intro cinematic and then we can dive straight into the campaign. Embers rise, stark against the night. The tyrant Dong Zhuo wields the flames of destruction. Luo Yang burns, chaos ignites as the power of the Unix is crushed. In the pyre, the hand falters. Yet the light of the dynasty still simmers in the hearts of its last descendants. Liu Bei swore an oath with his brothers. They pledged their lives. They will defend the Han. Nobody else can. Luo Yang lies in ruin, my lord. This tyranny is barbaric. What of the people? Dong Zhuo has fled west to Chang'an, with the young Emperor Xian his captive. He holds my nephew at sword point. The coalition delays and wastes time. You are poised, ready to strike now. Though we are fortunate to be under the protection of Lord Gon Xuanzan, the time may be coming to forge our own path. But yellow turbans and bandits still persist. There must be justice. The people deserve peace. Your sworn brothers are ready to fight. Their oaths were bound long ago. Dong Zhuo's treason must face justice. We are arrows on the wind, my lord. We fly wherever you command. Liu Bei starts off in a very interesting position as he does not own a settlement at the start of the game. To compensate for this, he has one of the strongest starting armies due to his legendary brother characters Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. As a result of this, I never felt a challenge or pressured in the campaign whatsoever as I could always rely on this army to win the day for me. I am sure as the campaign progresses and you run into other legendary characters like Lu Bu, things won't be as easy as defeating the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which you do at the beginning of the game. However, I still would have liked to have seen more pressure at the start of the game as you fight to stay in the running to become Emperor. The campaign map graphics look great, and even though they're not very grounded compared to other historical Total Wars, I think that it does a great job of immersing you in the romance side of the Three Kingdoms era. The campaign map itself is also extremely big, with many cities dotted around the map covered in all sorts of natural rivers and mountain passes that can be used to defend your provinces. So I am definitely a fan of this in both the strategic and aesthetic design for the campaign. Throughout the campaign you will receive certain missions that will encourage you to take out certain cities and defeat armies, giving you a whole wealth of bonuses such as satisfaction to characters and military supplies across your armies. We'll talk about these features a little bit more later on. This was nice as I could take Liu Bei in a certain direction that maybe he didn't necessarily follow in history, allowing me to really get that sandbox feel and hey if I managed to complete these missions along the way it was also a nice bonus. Each faction leader has a different mechanic which helps to shape their own kingdom. If your faction leader dies, then the mechanic can change depending on the type of character who takes over leadership. Liu Bei's faction mechanic is Unity. This is a resource that is built up over time by winning battles and releasing the prisoners, as well as completing missions and conquering cities. The higher your unity is, the more bonuses you will receive, such as an increase to the amount of characters you can have as governors, and a big boost to your economy. You can also spend this resource to annex certain ex-Han Empire cities without a fight. This is costly as you'll lose some of the bonuses that we just talked about as you spend the resource. I really like the idea of mechanics changing as different leaders take over. I think this will create a unique experience that we have never seen in Total War before, as things can quickly change and force you to adapt to a new playstyle. 
For example, you could start out with Liu Bei's unity mechanic, and then if he was to die in battle, you could quickly have to shift your faction focus to a mechanic like Cao Cao's ability, who relies much more on manipulating characters in Total War Three Kingdoms. Okay, so let's dive into the battle side of things now. I'll split this into two sections, looking at land battles now, and then moving on to sieges later in the video. I want to preface this that I'm a big fan of the older Total War games such as Medieval 2 and Rome 2 with Divide et Impera. I really enjoy the slower pace of battles in them games where the build up is just as exciting as when the battle lines clash. I definitely don't think the newer titles are bad just because the battles are fast paced, however they're just not necessarily for me which is absolutely fine. I just wanted to mention this so that you guys would know where I was coming from when I'm talking about the stuff I like and didn't like during battle. So let's start off on the campaign map. At the beginning of the game you will have a small army in your way which you have to go ahead and take care of quickly. This is nice as new players get a taste of battle which is basically unlosable and veteran players can just auto resolve it and move on. I would have however love to have seen a larger scripted battle at the beginning of the game that players would remember throughout the entirety of their playthrough, where you maybe only control a small part of a larger army so that new players don't get overwhelmed and larger players can make a huge impact on that battlefield. When you hover over an enemy army on the campaign map it will show you the relative power compared to your own army. This is a small addition but I really like it because it gives you a greater ability to plan your next move on the campaign map and weigh up your own options. Another small change to the battle screen is that they've renamed auto resolve to delegate. I guess it makes it seem more appealing, I just thought I would mention it. So a feature that immediately jumped out at me was the smart formation. This is again a small feature however I think it is a welcome one. Now when you select your army and right click and drag, your troops will no longer form one long line, but an actual formation, with infantry on the front, cavalry at the flanks, and archers behind, with your heroes taking the frontal positions alongside your infantry. The battle maps I played looked great graphically, and even though the first map I played was kind of flat without much going on, it didn't really feel that empty. I also played on a woodland map which restricted my visibility and made it hard to give effective commands. I could have just turned off the trees and branches, but I kind of liked the chaotic role that it played in the battle. As well as this, I fought on a very hilly map as well, which also provided a lot of terrain bonuses and abilities to outmaneuvering your opponent due to line of sight. So it's cool to see that battle maps will play quite a big role in the engagements themselves, but maybe we've been lacking from the most recent Total Wars. Alongside this, the animations for hero units and regular units were clean and the duels were fun to watch. I really didn't mind the lack of match combat for non-hero units and when we did get into a duel, they did look pretty cool. I'm a little bit worried that they will get old kind of fast depending on how many animations are actually in the duels for each character, but I'm sure, you know, they'll keep on adding them as more characters get added to the game through DLCs and future updates. Something that really put me off of the battle side of things was how quick they were. I think the first battle I fought only lasted 2 minutes, which you could put down to me just having such an overwhelming advantage and the very strong heroes, however I think the longest battle I fought only lasted 8 minutes, and that was mainly because the AI was waiting for another reinforcement army to arrive. For me, 20 vs 20 plus battles, as the AI was reinforcing with another army, should last way longer than just 8 minutes. I feel like that doesn't give me enough time to really apply much strategy to the battle, or even be kind of happy with how the battle went down, but I really played a huge part in it. I did however speak to one of the developers and he did mention that this build did have particularly fast battles due to the strength of heroes in this. Normally at these press events they do make the game a little bit easier so that press who maybe don't necessarily play the game every day like me can still have a fun time and win the day fairly easily. I also think later on in the game battles may last a little bit longer when you weed out all of the weak generals and heroes and are left with only legendary lords on the map as well as their elite armies. Overall the battles are way too fast for me personally and even with the developer telling me that they were slower in the current build of the game I still get the impression that it was only by a couple more minutes and really for a 20 v 20 or 30 unit battle as the AI had reinforcements to only last 10 instead of 8 minutes still does just not hit that spot for me. I think personally I'm going to have to look towards the historical mode which will hopefully prolong the battles in the better. I'm also kind of sad but I'm 
going to have to look towards the historical mode of the game because we don't know anything about it really right now but we assume the battles are going to last longer but I still want to be able to use the hero so maybe I'm even going to have to look past historical mode and look for mods to merge the two together and maybe that will hit the spot that I really enjoy. I do think though however that if you are a fan of Total War Warhammer battles you'll be right at home here and really enjoy your time. The scale of the units were also a little bit disappointing as many of the levy units I was recruiting only had 120 men in them. Now normally at these events we play on large unit scale so there's probably still another step up but even if that was to 160 men in a unit I still was a little bit underwhelmed by this as the game was set in China and with the recent showcase of the laboratory mode for Warhammer 2 I was just maybe expecting something a little bit more. This also feeds into my next point which is heroes in the game. Now I know that heroes are the main focus of Total War Three Kingdoms and that Liu Bei starts off with some of the strongest heroes at the start of the campaign but from my experience they played such a large role that it made me forget about the rest of my army as the heroes completely dominated the battlefield and could take on the enemy army almost by themselves. Now I feel like if the unit scale was doubled or maybe even tripled this would feel like less of an issue as your heroes could still be killing hundreds of people but there would still be loads left for the rest of your army to influence the battle. And I also don't want to just rely on the historical mode to get rid of this as I really like the implementation of heroes. I just wish they were nowhere near as strong as they are as it kind of makes your armies feel useless and they really just shoehorn the battle. It may also be the case that as the campaign develops into the mid to late game and you get higher tier units, they're able to do better. However, I also feel like the heroes will just get as strong as them and continue to kind of keep up this power level over, over the normal units in the army. Overall, the battles were fun. It just kind of felt like they were missing something. They didn't really give me that huge bit of satisfaction after winning a crucial engagement. Finally, when you win a battle, you have three options. The option to ransom prisoners for unity and money, seize the enemy supplies, which gives you more military supplies, and also recruit the prisoners for more replenishment. This is an old feature in Total War, but it was really cool to see them reinvent it. Giving you military supplies was a nice feature, which we'll talk about in a second, as well as that getting my special unity resource, which is specific to Lu Bei and that type of noble hero. It was just kind of awesome to see that put in there. So I definitely like that feature. Now let's move on to military supplies before taking a look at sieges. Military supplies are a resource that an army spends when they go campaigning into enemy territory and is only replenished whilst in friendly territory. If you run out of supplies, then your units will start to take attrition until you replenish your supplies. Your military supplies will go up fast if you are garrisoned inside the city. You can also obtain more by winning battles and through certain missions and events. These supplies will also drain quicker in the winter. I'm really happy that they added this feature into the game as it is something a lot of players have wanted for a long, long time. I also think it is implemented pretty well. Cities now also have a stockpile of food that will go up and down depending on the amount of food that is gained or lost during that season. City supplies are also used during sieges to feed the population and prevent you or the garrison from taking attrition. The stockpile limit can be increased by building certain buildings such as a granary. Now let's talk about siege battles which are back with a bang. No longer do you poor Warhammer fans have to suffer through these bad siege battles. We'll start off by looking at the minor city battles, which are now represented by resources. For example, the one we attacked was an iron mine. This minor settlement had its own custom map, which I was extremely happy to see. The map itself had multiple layers to defend as you progressed up the hill. This was really fun to fight over, and I can imagine that it will be great to duke it out in PvP. I didn't get to see any of the other resource maps, but I assume they have just as much detail in them. City battles follow a similar style to the older Total Wars, as the attacker is able to assault the city from four directions. In my 30 turns, I only got to play two siege battles, both of which were on different maps. Each of these siege battles I played had their own inner plaza that the defenders could fall back to, which made for really interesting gameplay. Especially the second map which had a much grander version of the inner plaza. I really hope that towards the late game we can get some really interesting city layouts as these sieges were a ton of fun to play and I can't wait to have a 40v40 unit battle on these maps. The AI also in the two battles I fought seemed to actually give a fighting retreat back to the city centre after the walls were lost. 
I didn't really get enough time to test this out, but from what I saw, it was pretty goddamn cool. The siege equipment that you can get at the start of the game was battering rams and siege tunnels, which I assume destroy the walls. All non-hero units will also deploy with grappling hooks, which they'll be able to use to climb the walls. This doesn't really bother me as it makes more sense than the ladders in Total War Warhammer. The only real downside of these battles was just how quickly they were over. Both of them lasted around about 6 minutes, but to be fair, I never ran into more than a garrison, so I assume if I assaulted a city with a full stack inside of it, the battle would have lasted much longer. Overall, I think the sieges could be my favourite part of the game, as long as there is decent map variation and they maybe last a little bit longer. Back to the campaign map now, as we take a closer look at characters. Each character has his own screen like this, where you can assign him weapons, armor, a mount, as well as followers and accessories. Weapons and armor will not only give you a bonus to the 5 stats you can see here, but also change your appearance on both the campaign map and in battle. This was a really nice change and I love to see the effect of not only in battle but also on the campaign map. If you defeat certain characters in battle, you can also take their items, which means you could obtain Guan Yu's legendary weapon and armor set for your own faction. Followers will also give you a whole range of bonuses, but I think the most interesting was formations. Some of which were movable testudo, loose formation and shield wall. These formations were applied to the units serving under the commander. Some of these were also army wide, as I got one follower which allowed me to deploy my entire army in Vanguard, which allowed me to deploy my forces much closer to the AI's deployment zone, basically creating a rush army. This was pretty enjoyable to use as it allowed me to tailor specific parts of my army to complete certain objectives. You can see character satisfaction here, keeping this number high is extremely important as if it drops below a certain number, your character has a chance of actually leaving your court and joining someone else. You can keep this number high by giving them certain pieces of equipment, assigning them roles in your court, or giving them a governorship of a city, as well as completing missions and winning battles. And simply just increasing the size of your empire will please them, because I mean who doesn't want to be in a successful kingdom? All of these features should hopefully make each character feel pretty unique, and allow you to create your own stories with even some of the more non-legendary heroes. Provinces have changed in Total War Three Kingdoms and no longer contain multiple cities. You will now have one major city and then a handful of smaller villages, which will normally contain some sort of resource. At first I was a bit disappointed by this, however after looking at the map I soon realised that there are still just as many cities on the campaign map as other titles, they are now just in their own province. It also took me a little while to get to grips with the UI, but when I did, things became a lot clearer. In the main city, building slots are tied to the size of the capital building. From what I saw, the final city upgrade allowed you to have 6 building slots. The minor resource villages only have one slot however, however they do have some deviation in their building chain. There are actually a ton of different building chains for the main city, which took me off guard and I loved the way that each chain was laid out. As you can see many of these building chains have different paths that they can take. This is also an awesome improvement to the building system and seems like it has a ton of depth. Finally let's take a look at the new technology tree which has been replaced with reforms. Every 5 turns, which is a year in Total War Three Kingdoms, you will be able to pass a reform. These range from obtaining new trade routes of other factions, or passing reforms that will increase taxation on the peasantry and improve satisfaction with certain character types. This is a nice change from the traditional tech tree, as you now know that you'll always get something every year in game. As well as this, there is also a ton of branches you can go down, which allows you to really customise your empire. I think overall the campaign is going to be excellent, with so many improvements from previous Total Wars, as well as a ton of new features. Battles were a little underwhelming for me, but Siege Battles brought the bar back up, and I can't wait to test out more maps. My favourite feature in the campaign would have to have been the addition of supply, as this will really pressure you to plan out your invasions and force you to stay close to friendly territory. That's going to be it for the video, unfortunately I didn't get to cover diplomacy which has seen a great amount of improvement, or dive into each feature as much as I would like to. This was due to the video only being allowed to be 20 minutes long, however hopefully I gave you a great idea of how the Total War Three Kingdoms campaign is shaping up. Be sure to go ahead and drop a like on the video if you enjoyed, comment below letting me know what you thought of the gameplay, and also subscribe to keep up to date with Total War Three Kingdoms.